be pretty positive. I'm going to see somebody now whose job it is to look at the surfaces of culture and analyse them. And I think Tate Modern is something that perhaps needs a bit of analysis to see what problems and difficulties lie beneath its successful surface. Spectacle is certainly something that they've gone for in a big way, and particularly with the displays in the turbine hall. Um, I think it, it's begun to present a certain kind of problem, um, which you could see very clearly with um, Doris Salcedo's work, Shibboleth. Um, Salcedo's a deeply serious, uh, indeed rather mournful artist who deals with uh, themes of genocide uh, and the war on the peasantry in, in Guatemala. Um, and with themes of, uh, of, of how that's remembered or, or indeed how that memory is suppressed very often. And for the um, Tate Turbine Hall, she did this piece called Shibboleth, a title which refers to massacre, which was a, a long crack which ran down the concrete floor right the way through from fore to aft, as it were, of, uh, of, of the yeah, Tate Modern Building. big crack in the floor. Exactly. I don't think, I mean, I got the impression anyway, that not many of the people who um, went to look at that work um, were sort of able to think about the things that Salcedo would have you think about. Um, after Carsten Holler's slides and, you know, various other works which are sort of taken as entertainment, I think people expect a sort of almost fairground atmosphere in that part of Tate, at least. And um, so, you know, people are playing with sticking their shoes in the, in the crack and dropping things down and trying to trip each other up. And there's all that sort of thing. And I suppose the crack mm. in the floor takes its place alongside three or four other big events there, yeah. which people see as more or less the same kind of thing, a stream of gigantic events that have a sort of comic, childish aspect mm. to them. And that started to sink in as, well, maybe that's what contemporary art is. Yeah. One-liners, almost. Yeah, well, that's the thing, that um, some of them may be one-liners, indeed, but, I th you know, I think Salcedo's work is not of that character, but it gets treated like that um, by the Tate audience, and, uh, you know, even against, perhaps, the, cura uh, the uh, intentions of the curators. While I take his point, I also think that for those people who encountered that crack and really looked at it and walked its length and peered down into its depths, particularly in the east end, the flat bit, where quite clearly, as the crack got deeper and deeper, if you really thought about what she was doing to the building, it was really an assault on the building. It was complete destabilizing work. But you know, if you took the time to, to, to think about it, you did actually get to an understanding of the fact that this was a Colombian artist and what she was doing was something that was not just a, a violent intervention into the turbine hall and into the structure of this Western museum and its history of modernism and its engagement with particularly Western modernism, but actually what it stood for within a much greater context. So you're saying those who charge sort of shallowness to the Turban Hall installations or shallow sensationalism, that's a little bit in the eye of the beholder maybe. Indeed. I mean, I, and there's no reason why people, I mean, the whole point of this installation is that people take from it what they want to take yes. from it. Yes, yes. All right. The sealed up crack remains at Tate Modern as a permanent memory of a work that was itself about memory. We all have our memories of things we've seen here, whether we've enjoyed them as entertainment or thought there was something deeper underlying the experience, further dimensions that could be explored, or even if we didn't like them and felt furious with them. Either way, these installations have left their mark and Tate Modern has succeeded in generating a mass popular audience for installation art, what used to be a totally narrow thing, enjoyed only by a few art insiders. When art museums become this popular, inevitably the question arises, is, is art really a mass medium? And what happens when you've got four million people going through a gallery, but no one really has the space and the quietness and the time to engage with works in a more contemplative fashion. Everyone's got a few seconds to look at something to take it on, to move on. Is this beneficial for the way we receive art? And it creates an environment that then artists have to respond to, realizing that this is how their art's gonna be received. Having said that, I still think it's overwhelmingly positive that millions of people who wouldn't come and look at art shows of contemporary modern art are coming here 
And even if they're glimpsing things and they don't have further background information than that one encounter, I think there's enough there that that can have an impact. The whole ethos of modern art has fundamentally changed. It must be popular, there must be mass audiences. Otherwise, art has failed. It's not a completely new attitude. It started at the Pompidou Centre in Paris, which was built over 30 years ago. You can easily line up the similarities between the Pompidou Centre and Tate Modern. They both have great big size as their calling card. They each have a fragmentary, drifting experience of art. And they have making monumental size at the same time very relaxed, as if the monumental, which used to be for kings, is now for everyone. An important aspect of the Pompidou Centre experience from the days when it first opened in the 70s was the fact that you went up it on an escalator. You go up all the different floors on a moving staircase. And I guess what that means is that you've got a spectacular experience, but at the same time it's casual. It's not uh, elitist or snobbish. It's a democratic, ordinary type of thing. Tate Modern is like the Pompidou in that it's always rehanging its displays of its permanent collection. This is a global trend that started a few years before Tate Modern existed. It comes from modern art museums generally, no longer insisting that there's only one way to see the history of all the styles and isms of modern art. But once Tate Modern opened, it quickly became famous for doing the most challenging and provocative rehangs. So when the Pompidou Centre recently did something so cheeky as rehanging its entire permanent display so only the work of women artists was on show, that Pompidou was taking a leaf out of Tate Modern's book. The Pompidou can afford to play around because modern art was invented in France, so lots of top modern art was produced there, and so the Pompidou owns lots of great modern art masterpieces. But Tate Modern simply doesn't have that. This is because, historically, Britain was much slower than France in getting the message of modern art. For various subtle social reasons involving Britain's very eccentric relationship to modern art, the old Tate Gallery didn't really collect anything that was much good, apart from one or two things. So Tate Modern has to tell a story of modern art based on an eccentric, gappy collection that it's inherited from the old Tate Gallery. Ten years ago, as the trucks brought all the modern art from the old Tate Gallery to Tate Modern, the curators had to decide how to make an impact with the collection they had. The head of international collections is Frances Morris, and it was her job to think up the way the collection was presented, working together with Tate director Nicholas Sirota. The established canons of modern art in their right chronological order were sometimes obeyed and sometimes disobeyed in an inspired, creative approach. Sometimes it meant you saw art that was obviously unconnected by style, attitude or dates, and you just had to go along with the clash. We had to do something with a collection that was both scholarly and serious and began to reflect really new, uh, important thinking about the nature of art and art history and was beginning to revise the canon and tear it apart and put new ideas into it. But at the same time, we wanted to open up art and open up those stories to as many people as possible. So it was a dual challenge. Tate Modern's way of showing its permanent collection has become a big success. But when Tate Modern opened and its collection was first arranged using the new approach, a lot of critics thought that while it was right to experiment open-mindedly, the experiment had too many failures. Many art critics complained, including me. On paper, they kind of go together. If you're an uh, art gallery curator, you might think they go together. In reality, to see them opposite each other is 
um, unpleasant and unreal and unlikely. One's a kind of record of an action, one's a beautiful, exquisite painting that wants you to look at it for a long time. So it has to be considered a kind of definite failure of the new Tate Modern. It seemed to me very important that we should stick with it um, because it had lots of really strong points. And every time I walked back into the galleries after reading a bad review, I thought, actually, this is really good. I think it's 